up in the morning edition. There would be a reduced need for parliamentary registration department staff and the public to interact with each other. The call for a permanent or continuous voter register to aid in the fight against COVID-19 also. It's about safety first, education always. The new school year has officially begun for thousands of students across the country in the government school system. And... I am a pink survivor because God gave me the strength to fight. The story of a breast cancer survivor. Those stories and more when the morning edition comes right back. Long time no see. You hear me? Long time no see. All fish, stew fish, stew conch. I love it all. Tourists come here to take our tours, experience our sun, sand, and sea, and they also spend money around town. I used to see a bunch of hogfish around here, but nowadays I hardly see any. You protect one area, the fish do their thing, make a bunch of babies that spread all over the sea. What's the problem? If we protect, certain parts of our sea. It keeps all parts working right. I was against that face, but knowing what I know now, I totally agree on having marine protected areas. I support marine protected areas. We support marine protected areas. Look for Bahamas Protected on Facebook. Sign the petition. Sign the petition. <laughs> Davis, thank you so much for tuning in. COVID-19 impacting voter registration for the 2022 election not that far off. During Monday's Ministry of National Security's virtual press conference, Parliamentary Commissioner Philip Turner said his department has faced challenges mainly because it's an in-person process. He's proposing that the government make the amendments to the Parliamentary Elections Act to help adapt to this new COVID-19 environment. This would involve replacing the five-year voters register, commonly referred to as the quinquennial register, with a permanent or continuous one. This process would require maintaining the existing register, registering only new voters, transferring existing voters who have changed residence, that is, living three or more months in a new place of residence, removing the deceased and incarcerated persons from the current register. The current register, commonly referred to as the 2016 register, which is due to expire in July of 2021, will be virtually indistinguishable from any new register prepared for the 2022 general elections, save for those persons who have died since the last election that will be removed from the current register, and those new voters added from July 2021 up to the closing of the register for the next general elections. Turner is also lobbying for a permanent voter register, citing these advantages. The advantages of an extension of the current register or the establishment of a permanent or continuous register would include the following. A register containing a core number of voters of over 187,616, less those who have died since the last general elections. A high level of integrity in the register based on the high percentage of persons who use a Bahamian passport as proof of their eligibility to register. That amount is over 85%. There would be a reduced need for parliamentary registration department staff and the public to interact with each other, as it is unlikely that the number of persons who change their residence since registering would be significant. 
COVID-19 undermining hygiene, health, and safety due to social distancing limitations at the Bahamas Department of Correctional Services. The Prerogative of Mercy Committee has been reviewing the files of prison inmates deemed high risk of contracting the virus. His National Security Minister, the Honorable Marvin Dames. That would include the elderly, comorbidity, persons who have completed more than half of their sentences with good behavior, and persons sentenced for minor and nonviolent offenses that don't compromise public safety. To date, the committee has recommended for approval by the Governor General the release of 57 persons, and others are currently being reviewed and considered at this time. Police reporting a continued downward trend in crime. Commissioner Paul Roll disclosing to the media yesterday between January and September 30th, crime decreased by some 10% over the same period last year. Regional decreases were observed in New Providence, Grand Bahama, Abaco, and other family islands at a rate of 4%, 46%, 39%, and 4% respectively when compared to the same period in 2019. Crimes against the persons decreased by 26% with 463 incidents compared to 629 in 2019. In particular, murders decreased by 29% and armed robberies decreased by 40%. Property crimes decreased by 5% with 2,680 incidents compared to 2,817 in 2019. In particular, House breakings decreased by 26%. Well, if any of you know where to find Garth Ewing Jr., it's best you call the police. The 30-year-old's wanted for attempted murder. A wanted bulletin lists Ewing's complexion as brown, built, medium, height 5 feet 11 inches, weighing 210 pounds, and having a low haircut. Police are advising you to approach the Hannah Hill 8 Mile Rock resident with extreme caution and care. Meantime, the senseless slaying of three children in recent weeks has caused much debate and outrage by members of the public and parents who are calling for stricter penalties to protect our little darlings. One of them is mother and opposition shadow minister of national security, the Honorable Glennis Hannah Martin. Martin says we must be honest with ourselves that crime is a major concern and strategies to combat this vexing issue must be shifted. The strategies being deployed are not having the effect that we should want. We should want more than just the numbers going from, from 10 to 8 uh, or from 100 to 80. We have to, we, we, we have to want that this level of violence to be ameliorated in this country. This is a sign of, of, of poor social health. And, and I think it's time for us to be honest. And, and when you're seeing now, when we're seeing now that this is now descending to the level or to the place where our children are at risk, then we are, you know, we, we, this, this is, this is a, a, a shift that is so serious and so detrimental that, it, it re, that we have to come to an, a, a realization that more now has to be done than what they've been doing before. Now, when it comes to the increase in the amount of guns circulating on our streets, Hannah Martin says the issue must be addressed as soon as possible. We have to look at the issue of um, uh, the, the, the guns, the amount of guns in this country. We have to we, and finally and seriously determine why and how these guns are getting into our country. We, don't, we do not manufacture them. We don't produce them. They're coming in under the radar. How is that happening? And why haven't we been able to get on top of that? Also this morning, noted psychologist Dr. Wayne Thompson says when the life of a child is lost senselessly, it has a grave impact on the mental well-being of parents and families of the slain child or children. He is asking for Bahamians to respect the privacy of the families and allow them to grieve. Children are the hope for the future. Children are the hope for the crisis that we are presently going through. And so for family members and loved ones, children not only are the hope for the future, but a very present joy. And so when a child is taken away from a family, a deep crater 
probably the size of the Grand Canyon emotionally is cut into those family members. Uh, because children are innocent. Because children show us how we ought to live and how we ought to forgive. Meanwhile, President of the Bahamas Christian Council, Bishop Delton Fernander, offering spiritual healing and prayers to the families and parents of children that have died in the crossfire recently. Bishop Fernander says it's quite upsetting to hear the news that innocent children are killed at the wrong place and time. The Bahamas Christian Council is deeply saddened and equally outraged that another life has been taken in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and in this case, another child been taken out senselessly. Our country is at the brink, at a challenging point, where we must ask ourselves, is this what we want? Do we want the vulnerable in our society to be taken out by gun violence? I pray that it causes the good people to rise up so that evil will not prosper. The latest COVID-19 dashboard showing 107 new cases, 88 here in New Providence, 10 in Abaco, 5 on Grand Bahama, 1 each in Cat Island and Eleuthera, and another 2 pending. That brings the total number of cases in the Bahamas to 4,559. The death toll is on the rise as well, now standing at 100, while 2 other deaths under investigation have now been classified as non-COVID-19 related. Meantime, Environment and Housing Minister, the Honorable Ramal Ferreira, the latest parliamentary, parliament, parliamentarian rather, to test positive for COVID-19. The Cabinet Office confirming as much in a release, adding that the minister is not experiencing symptoms at this time and is in quarantine. As a precautionary measure, all Cabinet ministers and staff who came in direct contact with Ferreira will be tested for COVID-19 and self-quarantine. The Cabinet Office making it clear, though, that the Prime Minister did not have direct direct contact with Minister Ferreira. Come October 15th, international travel will resume with it, hopefully an influx in visitors from unknown destinations. The 14-day mandatory quarantine or vacation in place order will be lifted come November 1st. However, the new protocols will require visitors and returning citizens and residents to obtain a RT-PCR test no more than seven days old prior to their travel to the Bahamas and to ensure travelers remain COVID-free. A rapid ant antigen test will be conducted upon arrival and then again four days or 96 hours after arrival. And while cases continue to rise here in the capital and health facilities are said to be at a capacity. Consultant and director of the National HIV and AIDS and Infectious Disease Program, Dr. Nakia Forbes, was asked about her thoughts on the issue. I would caution that it's would be best to reopen at a time when countries are not at full capacity, when we're not seeing increases in the number of cases, when we're fully at capacity to manage COVID-19 in country. And it, it is a real concern that uh, there are several locations nearby where we get a lot of visitors from that are still having surges and very, very high numbers of cases. Uh, if I could have everything I wanted, I would say that we could delay it, that we should delay it. One has to remember that policymakers must make decisions that balance health, economy, and socialization. With more than 4,500 confirmed COVID-19 cases here in the country and New Providence recording almost 3,400 of those cases, health officials are continuing to urge residents to take personal responsibility for their safety. The public really needs to look at the indicators for the serious situation and see what they can do to help to stop this outbreak. It is not all in the hands of the Ministry of Health or in the hands of the government. It is in our hands as individuals and members of the, the public to do our part, lest we end up in the hospital or in the morgue. And I'm not, you know, being sensational. There, there are real repercussions to this disease. And still to come, the new school year has officially begun for thousands of students in the government school system. That story and more when the morning edition continues.
Influenza, or the flu as it is commonly called, is a viral illness that usually occurs between the months October to March. The virus is transmitted from person to person through coughing, sneezing, or talking. Symptoms include fever, cough, headache, runny nose, generalized body aches, and fatigue. There is no specific treatment for the flu, and the symptoms usually dissipate after three to seven days. Because it is caused by a virus, antibiotics are not used to treat the flu. Persons are encouraged to rest and drink lots of fluids. Panadol is recommended for fever and body aches associated with the flu. However, aspirin should be avoided due to the risk of bleeding. To decrease the spread of flu, persons are encouraged to get their flu shot annually and practice good cough hygiene. Additional information can be provided by your community clinic or the Health Education Division at the Ministry of Health. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Public Hospitals Authority. During this pandemic, it is our duty to ensure that all citizens, residents, and visitors are adhering to the COVID-19 safety protocol. Restaurants may operate utilizing curbside pickup, drive-thru, takeaway, or delivery. Any establishment who allows the entry of any person not wearing a mask is liable upon a summary conviction to a fine of $500. I am Ambassador Ashanti Rukal of the COVID-19 Enforcement Unit. Save a life that may be your own. This message brought to you by the Ministry of National Security in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. The ZNS Community page now has its own home on Channel 230. Be sure to tune into this channel to see informative notices, funeral announcements, birthday greetings, and much, much more. So watch the ZNS Community channel today on Cable 230. Lighthouse on San Salvador to let you know that marine protected areas make dollars and cents. A well-designed and managed network of protected areas can generate income for nearby communities. From MPA managers to lodges to eco tours, there is money to be made. Healthy marine ecosystems help to protect our islands from climate change and other impacts that we cannot control. Healthy coral reefs help to break down big waves and mangroves absorb storm surge and help to protect our coastline. Older and larger fish tend to carry more and healthier eggs than younger fish. Fish replenishment areas will allow fish to grow bigger and ensure that we have more fish now and in the future. In our replenishment area, fish are free to grow and reproduce. As their populations increase, more fish will spill over into other areas where fishermen can increase their catch and their income. I support the establishment of a marine protected area on my island. I support the establishment of marine protected areas on my island. I support the establishment of marine protected areas on my island. I support the establishment of a marine protected area on my island, and you should too. And you should too. And you should too. And you should too. See the future with Bahamas Protectors. Protectors. officially begun for thousands of students across the country in the government school system. Lloyd Allen is on the road once again, this time in Stingray's country. Good morning, Lloyd. Well, good morning again, LaDon. Good morning, Bahamas. This morning, of course, we know across the nation, it's day two of the start of the new school semester. And this morning, we're here at C.V. Bethel High School, and we're speaking with one of the newest principals on the block, Harcourt uh, McCoy. Yes, and uh, of course, uh, welcome to the morning edition. And talk to us about your experience so far. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going on this year, COVID-19, new restrictions, protocols, and the likes. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say uh, happy belated World Teachers Day to our teachers. We, ser we shared yesterday World Teachers Day, but um, we're in the process now of getting ready for the opening 
Um, once again, pro the protocols for COVID-19 in place, everybody having on a mask, making sure that there are frequent sanitization stations. But our biggest um, issue right now is trying to keep teachers and students motivated, keeping the parents and stakeholders informed with good communication. We're hosting a number of PDA meetings, um, virtual PDA meetings. Um, I think our last one is actually today, tomorrow, pardon me. Um, but our orientation is actually virtual. And so we're using the Zoom platform to allow our teachers, our parents and all of our students to be able to find out all of the information relative to logging on to the new Ministry of Education platform. Um, we are inviting those parents on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday for grade 10, 11 and 12 in that order to collect the username and passwords for our students um, and a package with basic information about how to log on their individual timetables and the like. Teachers are doing their last minute um, workshops and trainings to be aware of how to upload their data and their classes, to upload resources, PowerPoint presentations, YouTube links, um, and assignments. And so it's a very busy time here at CV Bethel, but our theme for this year is very important. We have chosen to um, achieve excellence in 2021 with resilience and innovation. And that's just what's going to be required, a lot of resilience and innovation. Now, Mr. McCoy, just a few years ago, of course, you would have been right in the classroom. And now you're having this new experience with administration and uh, operating as the principal. How has your experience been so far? Um, the versatility of being a teacher, an administrator, and a young one at that um, is one that I, I, I find to be most important because I, I remember what it was like to be a teacher, to plan for lessons and keep those lessons interesting. Yep. Now that we're on the Zoom plot, the, um, sorry, the Office 365 and going virtual, it's very important that those lessons be interesting because as you know, the children will be at home. Um, there will be no teacher physically in their space. We've set some requirements. Um, for parents to isolate a room where the children cannot be disturbed and um, the camera is always on. Yeah. But very important, um, those lessons need to be interesting and very much engaging so that the students are, um, remain in those lessons and um, complete the task ahead going towards the Christmas. And another question as well. I know, of course, uh, one of those things uh, for myself uh, as a former teacher is uh, being in that classroom and being in front of those students, but also requiring their attention. Uh, you, of course, um, would understand that many students now coming into the system, those are uh, uh, for the first time virtually. Uh, and even you as a principal coming into the system for the first time as a principal virtually. Uh, what is one of your biggest hopes uh, this school year? Um, one of the biggest challenges I think um, we will all have is to be communicating. And so we're going to set up um, a number of hotlines so that parents could be able to reach us um, through our guidance department. Parents can call into that number and be able to um, get information relative to their child. We know that there are going to be some hiccups. Um, just last night we were having a virtual PDA meeting and then we had issues with Cable Bahamas Island wide. And so sometimes there may be issues with internet with the electricity and um, a host of other things so we'll try to see how we can remain flexible and get it done but our goal is to have 100 percent of our students logged on and participating in virtual education here at cv bethel how many students again uh just over 1200 Wow. Yes. So quite a big load there, but of course, uh, uh, like ourselves, uh, we're hoping for you guys to be successful uh, for this new school year, virtually and otherwise. So much more coming in from CV Bethel later on in our newscast. But for right now, reporting here from CV Bethel High School for the morning edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. The J.A. Thompson Jr. High School has canceled face-to-face -face student orientation. The virtual orientation is for 7th graders and new students only this Thursday at 11 a.m. Those students in grades 8 and 9 are asked to visit the school's Facebook page for links for, to the virtual orientation items on Wednesday. Orientation activities includes online learning protocols, distribution of timetables, and device usage. Principal at T.A. Thompson is Ishmael Smith. 
We were expecting 263 students, 251 students really. Uh, I said 63 because there will be students who may be coming in through eighth or ninth grade, but particularly seventh grade, roughly about 251 students. Uh, we're resetting to the a virtual presentation, a Zoom presentation. We're getting ready to, to push that information out now to get it out there. Um, but again, as the director and the minister said, it's, it's about safety first, education always. And hopefully through engaging them virtually and digitally, we could iron out and get them kind of used to some of those kinks of operating digitally. So we're hoping to do two things at once, which would be orientation and also provide access and hands-on so they can become familiarized with that, what that online or that digital interface is going to look or interaction is going to look like. Smith said he learned a lot from hosting the national exams at the school. The routine was pretty much the same. It's just that we had to ensure that there was proper distancing and you may have used one or two classrooms. But the process, with the exception of having to wash your hands, wear your face mask, uh, was pretty much the same. And they came in and, and they participated. Going forward, that's something that the school is going to work on in terms of how it's going to look for the student to sit uh, examinations in the new cycle. It's something that we don't know, but it's something that we are preparing to work with and adjust to as the demands come. Over in Grand Bahama, District Superintendent of Education Ivan Butler toured the West District on day one of the new academic year. He says while it is great to see that schools have officially opened, it's important that the safety of the students and teachers are given priority. I've visited um, the West End Primary and the Home Truck Primary and now here at the 8 Mile Rock High School. And that is only to lend support to the principals and administrators and to ensure that all of our protocols, all of the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health protocols are being adhered to during this time. And let me also say that I'm very pleased with um, what has taken place thus far today. I'm sure the same process is being um, done at our schools in the Freeport area. But our kids have been showing up to school. We have all our teachers have reported to work. So we got off to a very good start today. Face-to-face -face orientation exercises taking place on Monday for students at the Old Bight High School on Cat Island. Acting Principal William Ford says the seven students in grade 7 and the 20 students in grade 10 who participated in the orientation exercises, along with teachers and support staff, all adhere to the COVID-19 health and safety protocols in order to avoid community spread. We will screen them as they enter the campus, um, temperature check, um, hand sanitizers and all of that. Encourage them to be uh, social distance, um, six feet apart in the yard. Uh, we were in the classroom, they were three feet apart with the desks and the chairs. And uh, we would have apprised them of uh, the rules, the school, they were given the school rules. But, um, and we also had a live game on the campus today and they would have donated uh, the devices to them along with contract. Scores of students now have access to online learning thanks to the efforts of Great Cliff Bahamas, that organization partnering with the Bain and Grantstown community. Here's Desmond Saunders. These 72 students will have full access to the Great Cliff facilities to attend virtual classes that will rotate five days a week from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. A vigorous rapid COVID-19 test required for students and volunteers. Students have access to over 40 plus digital devices with books, pens, and textbooks in a safe, sanitized, fun, COVID-free environment. Raycliffe will also provide swimming lessons for participants. Co-owner of Greycliff Bahamas, Roberto Gazzarelli, says a partnership between the Bain and Grantstown constituency and the Ministry of Education is vital towards the upliftment of students within the Bain and Grantstown community. She spoke about how the project was conceived. We thought about the little children who couldn't even have the opportunity, didn't have a computer, didn't have internet, didn't have somewhere to go. Your parents can't stay home with you to learn. So it was 10 o'clock at night. I wrote a quick email to Mr. Robinson and I said, we have an idea. And two seconds later, he wrote back. He goes, yes, I'm coming over tomorrow. So that's how it all started in a matter of five minutes. Member of Parliament for the Bain Grants Town community, Travis Robinson, underscored the significance of the program. And as your member of Parliament, for the Bain and Grand Sound constituency, I am acutely aware 
of the challenges that many households face. Some homes are without electricity and internet ac access. Some parents are unable to provide electronic digital devices for their children at this time to attend online learning. And therefore, the launch of this Bain and Grand Sound Virtual School Great Cliff Campus is important to ensure as a community we assist in achieving the Ministry of Education's core vision, which is that all students in the Bahamas receive a quality education, no matter of your status, your race, or ethnicity. The Member of Parliament believes that education is the most powerful weapon for global change. He's now soliciting the support from corporate Bahamas to enhance his virtual learning platform. Our community is better off today because of Great Cliff and the Gazzaroli family, humanitarianism, and for living up to their responsibility, their corporate social responsibility. And it is my prayer that other corporate, uh, that others in the corporate community will mark the manner. These 72 students are the first to benefit from the virtual community school. Learning will now become readily accessible, safe, and fun during this COVID-19 period. Desmond Saunders, ZNS Network News. Members of the Hope Center hosted a small back-to-school giveaway for students in the church and the community this past Sunday. Pastor Carlos Reed told ZNS News before the event took place that the outreach initiative happens every year, but has taken on a different approach due to the coronavirus. This year we're scaling it down because we don't know basically how things are working. So we're going to give about 50 uh, back backpacks. We're going to do so on Sunday and uh, whatever spill off this an area right close to us that we're going to be able to take them across our over in Big Point and be able to help some of the kids going over, uh, going back to school over there. School of crayon, geometry set, some have, and these not just uh, one and two books. We make sure that we wanted to have a, a, a enough books for the kids to be able to do all the different subjects. And like I said, they got all kind of little goodies inside this, even scissors, crayon pencil rulers, uh, some for the older kids. Alive is another corporate citizen assisting with back to school. This morning we're joined alive by Chief Commercial Officer Gravette Brown. Gravette, welcome to the Morning Edition. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So this is back to school is like no other and alive is helping out in a very meaningful way. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yes, we really are trying to do a number of things this year. So first of all, we have a number of interesting commercial offers in our retail stores. So we have packages for $230, $230 or $450 with varying um, tiers of, of tablet devices, um, which are on offer. So that will include a tablet, a keyboard, a 16 gigabyte card, um, and also our, our big unlimited uh, MiFi plans along with a MiFi device. We have a great cool pad um, plan and also a Samsung plan. On the other front, you know, we always do a lot with back to school every year in terms of giving back to those who are more in need. And this year we've partnered with the Ministry of Education to um, help them source and provide uh, for students who are on their student lunch voucher program. Mm. So we started that distribution about two weeks ago in the Southern Islands. So we went everywhere, Mayaguana, Inagua, Crooked Island, Acklands, Rum Key, and now we're moving up into the central Bahamas, which is, you know, Nassau, Eleuthera, um, Andros, Abaco, and Grand Bahama. And um, through that program, we are going to be donating. Um, we, we will be providing, rather, um, the ministry with about 10,000 um, devices. So we are in the process of rolling out the first 5,000 of those to schools. Um, and we're also providing a, um, a bespoke, a customized data program for some of those students also. Since the initiative, what has the response been like? Um, we have just started rolling out in Nassau um, over the weekend. Um, I think the response is positive. I think, as you've seen in some of the other features in your newscast, um, getting our kids uh, into virtual learning and ensuring that they can participate is really central to all of our educational initiatives in the Bahamas. Um, and so we are pleased to be a part of that, and we're pleased to be, to be working along um, with the ministry, as Minister Lloyd announced last week, to, to help them accomplish that. Um, in addition, 
addition later on this week as a group, the Cable Bahamas group will be making some other announcements in terms of what we intend to do um, to, to attack the digital divide in the country as a whole. So, so we're very excited. We have, we have a number of offers and opportunities um, both in our stores and then, as I've just said, um, it, through, our, through our give back um, campaigns, things that we are doing uh, both in partnership with the Ministry of Education and with other um, with other large nonprofits or organizations. I want to say also that all of our tablets, all of our devices have been our Ministry of Education approved, meaning that they meet the specs. Um, they more than exceed the minimum spec that the Ministry of Education has detailed as being necessary for virtual learning um, in the Bahamas. Corvette Brown, thank you so much for joining us here on the Morning Edition, and best of luck to you in a live on your initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had a new coffee shop in Delhi open here in the capital. You're watching the Morning Edition. Hurricane watch or warning has been issued, it is extremely important to be prepared and know just what to do. Stay informed about the storm's path by listening to the radio or television for hurricane progress reports. Check emergency food and household supplies. Be sure you have extra batteries for flashlights and radios. Bring in outdoor items like lawn furniture and garden tools. Anchor objects that cannot be brought inside. Secure buildings by closing and boarding up windows. Remove outside antennas and satellite dishes. Turn refrigerators and freezers to the coldest settings, opening only when absolutely necessary and closing quickly. Purchase ice and store it in an ice chest. Keep drinking water in clean jugs and bottles. Clean your bathtub with bleach and fill it with water for washing and flushing, not for drinking, making sure to keep the bathroom door closed so that small children cannot access the filled tub. Do not go out to videotape or take photos of the storm. Take pictures from inside where it is safe and dry. There is no harm in being overly cautious where a hurricane is concerned. It is truly better to be safe than sorry. This public service announcement has been brought to you by the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas in conjunction with the National Emergency Management Agency. During this pandemic, it is our duty to ensure that citizens, residents and visitors are adhering to the COVID-19 safety protocol. Cleaning and sanitizing will help stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Pay special attention to areas that are frequently touched in high traffic by family, friends and clients. Make sure you're using proper cleaning materials and sanitizers. Place all cleaning materials in the correct disposal or storage area. I'm Ambassador Brittany Johnson of the COVID-19 Enforcement Unit. Save a life that may be your own. This message brought to you by the Ministry of National Security in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. Well, there's a new coffee shop in the house centered in the heart of the Hope Center in Oaks Field. It's the brainchild of social activist and Pastor Carlos Reed. During a soft opening last week, Reed revealed to the ZNS News crew that the response by customers has been pretty good, and he later gave us a brief check of what's on the menu. People are coming in, people are, you know, people like new things. And we have gotten some good reviews, you know, persons really like the food. One of the goals here is to be able to uh, uh, have good healthy food and uh, a good environment with good service. And not only that, food that tastes good, you know. Where we have a... Uh, most of what we deal with is healthy food. We got waffles, we have eggs, sandwich like uh, crab salad, chicken salad. We get salmon uh, salads. Uh, we have sandwiches. We have wraps. Uh, we have like uh, some good, like old-fashioned lemonade. But we also have like some special lemonades, like like the pumpkin ginger lemonade and all that different stuff. Man, here you just gotta come down to see everything that we got. While basking in the scrumptious cuisine on the menu, Reed later told us where the idea for the coffee shop in Delhi originated from. I'm a coffee lover and I frequent uh, 
Starbucks down in Cable Beach. One morning I came from home and didn't have an opportunity to stay I mean, to get coffee. So when I came in this area, there was no place that you could think about to get a cup of coffee. You know, I said, wow, man, this, this, this is what's needed in this area. Not only that, you know, sometimes you hear during the day and you run out of things to eat. And the only thing around here to eat is unhealthy food. So, you know, we should say that if we could do something where we could incorporate coffee with some good food, we got something that uh, we could market. And that's the coffee house in Delhi was born. More than two-thirds of current recruits at the Royal Bahamas Defense Force are second to third generation officers. This move is proven to be a step in the right direction, as his next profile proves heritage and grit are important tools to becoming a stellar officer. Here's Lloyd Allen. Defense Force leading seaman Enoch Smith says a fishing trip at 11 with his father, a former Marine, changed his life forever. One day he anchored the boat out, let's say about, I'd say maybe, maybe about a 50 meters or whatever from the land. And he jumped over and he swam back to shore and he said, swim back to shore. And I was like, well, I'm kind of scared because it was deep water. He's like, come on. And then I, do I dove over and uh, I was pretty scared, but I remember that day. A few years later in 2005, he joined the Defense Force, walking the same halls his dad had a decade prior. From there, I was in Commando Squadron Department. That's the amphibious unit, and uh, we do a lot of uh, swimming and a lot of uh, infantry work and stuff like that, so water plays a big role. Smith specializes in military diving, dive medicine. He's a certified PADI open water scuba instructor and has assisted dozens of his colleagues with improving their underwater skills and techniques. As a military dive in the Royal Bombs Defense Force, we always have some, um, some activity or some operation that we have to take part in. So it's, uh, it's a necessary part to make sure that all the divers are up to skill and up to standard in diving. I see you take off at bottom hell for the first three minutes. Right? Yeah, and yeah, then you get your and you like, okay. Every so often, there is at least one diver who needs extra help. Smith says he believes in the leave no man behind principle. You never know who you're going to end up with. You can't say, I don't want to dive with this person, I don't want to dive with that person. But as a member of the dive team and an instructor, it's our job to make sure that everyone can carry out the necessary skills and uh, dive operations they need to. A father of three, this Marine says he doesn't want to pressure his children to follow in his footsteps, but is simply happy to be an inspiration. I may be tooting my own home, but they love the dad and um, they inspire me. Well, they motivate me to keep pushing and to keep doing uh, more and more because every time that I reach a plateau, I try to go on into something else and it's because they are watching me. Uh, I try to do my best in everything and I try to impart that knowledge onto them. Smith adds, over the years, his experiences have been life-changing, showing him the fragility and wonder in open water. He encourages other salt lifers to consider the defense force as a career. It's a new world out there in terms of diving, and it's an experience that you would have to see yourself. Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and this morning, Shashina Roe Farkasen highlights a survivor who has beaten the odds and won the war against this dreaded disease. Today, she wears a bright smile with a grateful heart just because she's in the land of the living. You see, life changed quickly 10 years ago for wife and mother of three children, Lori Pinder, when she made the worst discovery of her life. We were actually on vacation in Atlanta, and I just went to take a shower. I didn't even um, say, let me just do a breast check. It's just a habit of how I bathe, and I felt the lump. And like I said, I wasn't looking for it, but I felt it. I told my husband about it, and when we came back to Grand Bahama, I immediately seek uh, medical attention, and I had the biopsy done shortly after. She was then diagnosed with a stage two breast cancer here in Grand Bahama. When they sent off the receptor test that you have to take to see uh, what kind of chemo you would take, the doctors here didn't understand 
what the triple negative was. I saw negative, 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 but in my mind, I'm um, like, I wasn't settled with it. I asked the doctor, what does that mean? He's like, you are right, you are right. But I was not settled with it. But because she was not confident in that diagnosis, she contacted a U.S.-based doctor, where it was made abundantly clear that this type of cancer was extremely aggressive. The next nine months would not be easy, as she sought care in the United States away from her husband and children. Laurie says while she had an awesome support team, there were times she felt alone. God always sent, when I, the days that I planned my funeral, God always sent somebody to call me and encourage me. And this particular day, I was feeling kind of down, and a lady named Christine Russell Sweeting, who is a cancer survivor, she just happened to call me. And she was like, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And she said, you don't sound right. I said, I'm okay. So she was like, Lori, I had days like that that I planned my funeral. And just as she said that I knew God sent her because that's exactly what I was going through. Her ultimate prayer was for God to keep her until her young children were grown. Hear how she describes her chemotherapy treatments. It stops your immune system and it takes your energy and you sleep a lot. And the second set of chemo that I took, I actually was crippled. I had severe joint pains that I had to use a walking cane to walk for at least five days. Essentially, Lori would have a double mastectomy as she was also diagnosed as being BRAC1 positive, which means that she inherited this type of cancer. She says every day it was a mental and emotional fight. You read about this particular cancer. All you read about is how fatal it is. So I had to look at myself in, in the mirror every day and I had to recite, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. And I have to think and imagine me being home with my children. <laughs> when I start to think that I may not see my daughter graduate, and I may not see my boys graduate primary school, I have to pray and I have to ask God to give me that strength to make it through. I will not complain. I just have to go through what I need to go through to get home. Lori was diagnosed in October 2010, and by June of the following year, she was cancer-free. After years of biannual follow-ups, she was just given the all-clear for a once-a-year checkup by her doctor this year. Here's why she says she is a pink survivor. I am a pink survivor because God gave me the strength to fight. significant traffic coming out of the Pinewood community on the other side of the break. A complete look at overnight traffic as well as some reminders to drivers when it comes to traffic signs. When a hurricane strikes, there are many critical needs to survival. Water is one of them. Access to clean water to drink bathe and wash things is often hard to come by, particularly in remote areas. While it's tempting to use whatever water is available, there are a few things that you should do to make sure that your drinking water is safe to consume or use. Boiling your water is one of them. Boiling water kills most pathogens that can be harmful. If your water is cloudy, Filter it through a clean cloth or portable filter. You should boil filtered water for one minute, cool, and then store in a clean container with the lid. If boiling your water is not an option, you can disinfect it with bleach. Use 1 8 teaspoon or 8 drops per gallon, then let it stand for 30 minutes. Remember, this water should be stored in a clean container with a lid ensuring the highest level of food, animal, and plant safety in the Bahamas. This message is brought to you by the Bahamas Agricultural Health and Food Safety Authority and the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas.
team is standing by with your Tuesday morning traffic commute. The traffic report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance, today, tomorrow. Well, a great start to your Tuesday morning. Good morning, Ladon. Good morning, Bahamas. Again, we're here at Zion Boulevard and E Street, uh, just opposite the uh, Pinewood Police Station. And so far this morning, uh, traffic uh, is steadily coming out of this area, going into the uh, E Street North direction. And so, of course, no major obstructions. Again, we want to remind drivers that various road works going on throughout the island uh, may cause some hindrance. And so, of course, you want to drive with caution and care as you're making your way to your various destinations. Also this morning, we're speaking with Sergeant Kirsten Ia Johnson from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division, giving you a beautiful look at overnight traffic. A pleasant good morning to you and a pleasant good morning, Bahamas. Overnight, we've had 10 traffic accidents, 8 involving damage, and 2 hit and run accidents. At this time, there still remains 4 persons who are hospitalized as a result of being involved in a traffic accident. All right, so some good news there. Those numbers are down. But this morning, we're talking about something, again, very important to drivers. Traffic signs. Now, of course, uh, like this police station across the street, there's a clear sign that indicates to drivers not to block the entrance. But uh, there are some other signs that we uh, may have learned during driver's ed. And so we're kind of walking you through some of those important reminders. I call them key signs that every driver needs to know. Well, let's just start off by talking about what signs are. Signs are erected to provide information. They also are to provide instruction for all road users. So once you're on the street and the sign is erected, you want to pay attention to the signs. Before, in the earlier years, they used to use just um, words on those signs, but now they have chosen to use pictorial signs. This is to overcome language barriers and to increase public and road safety. So if you're traveling on a street and you see a sign, sometimes those signs are going to be in, in writing. But if those signs are in writing, that is a message to you as a driver not to do a particular thing or to advise you that a particular act is going on on that street. So if you're traveling on a street and you see that sign, you want to pay attention to what's going on and what is being instructed or advised to you as a motorist and as a pedestrian if you're using the street. So additionally, we have signs such as no U-turns, there's no parking areas, loading zones, stop signs, especially stop signs. Usually drivers underestimate the power of stop signs. If a stop sign is erected, you want to, as much as possible, pay attention to that intersection because it is advising you that your thoroughfare may not be be the major road. In fact, you may be entering a major road and you need to ascertain you'll be clear. So yes, these all of these signs are important and you must adhere to them if you're using the, if you're using the streets. All right, so a mouthful there. Of course, we've taken you back to driver's ed, giving you an experience of those signs that you want to look out for. And so, of course, if you're not sure, again, some information is going to be coming out later today on our social media. You want to check that out. But, of course, you want to drive with caution and care as you're making your way to your various destinations. That's been a look at your Tuesday morning, Friday report. Tuesday morning traffic report uh, from this uh, intersection here on East Street for the morning edition. Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. And it's time now for your Tuesday workout session with Natasha Brown. Procrastination is the cancer of our success. And the only cure is a mindset of consistency. Thank you for joining Downtowns for another dynamic session. Let's get right to it.
and see. Until next time, I am downtown Natasha Brown, taking you closer to becoming your ultimate you. false bottom because they look empty to me <laughs> not for long you taking a shop in right now for what things you're gonna need in case you can't get out of your house after a natural disaster we know when we had one hurricane around here does it we get two locks <laughs> it ain't only hurricane you know we gotta worry about you know you know we could have tsunami or we could have earthquake and you know they don't give you no time to go shopping what kind of earthquake and just, just find one faulty line over there by my corner. And even though they say it's stationary, it dare. So we need to go and get our survival kit. Like what? What you mean, like what? <laughs> Plastic bag to put your important papers in. Like water. Medication. Flashlight. Radio. Canned goods. Things you need. Things you might need just in case you can't get out of your house after a natural disaster. These two plastic containers, the chewing them could paint them up in their special colors so they could know what they're looking for when you send them to look for it. That's one thing I like with you. You always ready. This weather report is sponsored by Bank of the Bahamas, the bank of solutions. And that's a wrap for us this morning. For the entire team, I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a great day.